Last week, we began our journey on the Reformation. We began by looking at Scripture alone. We saw that last week that the Roman Catholic Church had Scripture, but also on the same level as Scripture was the Pope's decrees, doctrines, the teaching of the councils, the decree of the councils, and sometimes it would go above what Scripture said. So I want to make it clear. Regarding the Reformation, the Reformation was not about destroying the church or discovering some new type of doctrine. Rather, Luther uncovered what had been covered up by tradition, by decrees, and error. Luther's intent was to let God's word and his truth speak first and foremost above all. That's also why he translated the Bible into German. As a matter of fact, he is credited for a lot of the German language because of his translation of the original Greek and Hebrew into German. He said, I want to give the Bible to the common folk, to the layman. He said that a simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the greatest pope who is out without scripture. So let's talk about Luther for just a little bit because I don't know how much you actually know about him. He didn't start, set off to uh, be a monk or a theologian. His father actually was a miner in Germany and became uh, somewhat wealthy. And his father wanted his son to become a lawyer because then he would also be well off. So at the age of 13, Luther went off to school. He was a middling student, not that great, but he worked very hard. And by the age of 21, though, in 1505, he was on his way to a town called Erfurt. And uh, he was there and there was a big storm brewing and there was a huge thunderclap that was right by him. Have you ever been like by one of those? Like it's so loud, you just practically jump out of your skin. This was how loud it was. It scared Luther, and he cried out, Help me, Saint Anne, I will become a monk. That's what he cried out. Well, he survived, and true to his word, he became a monk. He entered in the summer of July, July 1505, St. Augustine's Monastery. He was an extraordinary monk. He plunged into prayer, fasting, and ascetic practices. So I want to show you this. Now, we normally see Luther in the old age. He's a very uh, jowly, kind of heavy, little heavy set as a monk. He was as thin as a rail because the ascetic practices were something like this, going without sleep, enduring bone chilling cold without a blanket, flagellating himself. Have you ever hear, heard of hair shirts? People wearing hair shirts? Hair shirts were made out of uh, like horse hair. You've, have you worn a wool sweater just on your skin and how itchy that is? Think of horsehair on your back. It would literally rub your back raw. These were some of the practices that monks and people of the day would be doing because they were to die to self. And so they did all of these things in order to die to self. Luther commented later in his life, he said, if anyone could have earned heaven by the life of a monk, it was I. That's how good he was at, at all these practices. You see, in that day, the Catholic Church and the theologians at the time pretty much had this mindset. They said, do what is within you and God will be merciful. Work as hard as you can and God will be merciful. In our vernacular, we would say, do your best and God will do the rest, right? We've, we've, you probably have heard a version of that somehow today. This is why the Reformation is still important, because that mindset is still around. It is, do what is within you and God will be merciful. Do your best and God will do the rest. It's still here today. So today, we are going to go to 
sola fide, or faith alone. And you're going to see, hopefully, how important this understanding of Scripture is in that we have faith alone. So we are going to wrestle with a particular text that Luther wrestled with. And if you want to highlight a text, if you've got your Bible, open up to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. If you want to understand the whole central theme for Paul's letter to the Romans, this is it. This is the theme for the entire letter. You see, Paul has been saying in his preface before this that he's eager to come to Rome. He's eager to come to his brothers and sisters in Christ to be able to preach the gospel. If you remember, if you were here several weeks ago, we talked about how Paul was compelled by the love of Christ. He was compelled by the gospel. And he says it in a such a way that it's a little different here. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's a different way to say it, isn't it? He could have said, I am proud of the gospel. I love the gospel. But the greater impact is for him to stand up and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I have not one iota of doubt I have not one smidgen, one little reserve at all about the gospel. The way he says it, it makes you stand up straight. I am not ashamed of the gospel. You and I, that mostly pulls us up short, that phrase. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I mean, think about it. You probably have a favorite movie that you are willing to share. And you'll even somehow bring it up in a conversation when it doesn't even belong in that conversation. Or you have a restaurant that you love and you're excited about the restaurant. But bring up the gospel? No. Don't want to do that. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. See, why, why do we not, with the same fervor, with the same zeal, be able to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel? I think there are a couple of reasons. I don't know what it is for you. I'm just going to list a couple of them, not in any particular order. I think some people actually don't know what the gospel is. I actually know that for a fact because I've asked a lot of people throughout all different walks of life, churched, unchurched, what the gospel is, and most people don't actually know. So you don't even know about it. Some people uh, might be hesitant. They've never shared the gospel, and so they feel awkward about it. They might not have the right words. They haven't gone to seminary or something like that. Some people might uh, think, well, they're not going to be receptive. I might annoy them. They might become annoyed with me. Some people have been brought up to never discuss religion. It's just not polite to discuss religion. <laughs> and by the way, uh, Jesus didn't think so. And uh, Paul and Peter and all the apostles, they didn't have that. Some people think that the gospel is simply a matter of preference. Well, this is what I prefer. Other people prefer something else, so eh, let's not talk about it. And other people might think, well, I'm saved. I got my into heaven. I don't have to worry about anybody else. Say, I don't know what it is for you. I really don't know. But think about this. Would you be willing to stand up in a crowd and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel? Paul could say this because of one factor alone. 
because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. It's the power of God for salvation. But most people think, well, that's, that's a nice phrase. It's the power of God for salvation, great. But what does that actually mean? What's the power of God for salvation? What does salvation mean? Most people haven't thought about that. So you have to think, what am I saved from? Because if you're saved, you're saved from something. And if you're saved, you're saved for something. So one commentator put it this way, and I thought it was kind of a nice way to say it. From what, for what? So when we say we are saved, it is from the effects of sin. One effect of sin is guilt. And if you've got your sermon notes, it has a lot of cross references in there for you. That you are guilt, not just guilty like a feeling, but you are guilty of sin or trespass against God. And so what the gospel does, it saves you from your trespass, from your guilt to God's righteousness. It also says we are polluted, that we are stained with sin through and through. But we are saved for God's holiness. That we are saved from being slaves to sin. We have freedom in Christ. And that, that there is, we are saved from punishment to God's blessedness. And now you have a number of things in there on your sheet. It talks about that there, before Christ, you were alienated from God, that without Christ, you bear the wrath of God, that there is everlasting death. In Christ, you have fellowship with God. The love of God is shed abroad in the heart. You have everlasting life. It's the power of God for salvation. From what? For what? See, a lot of churches, a lot of teaching will cancel out the from what. They'll say, you're not a sinner, you're not guilty, you don't need to be pardoned, you're a good person as it is. And by the way, if you take that off the equation, there is no for what. What are you saved for? I don't know. I'm just saved. See, there's a church actually last year, and even this year, a large synod who said, we don't want to talk about the Great Commission because it might offend people. They said, in essence, that they are ashamed of the gospel, that it has no power. Here it is. The gospel is God's power that brings those who are dead in sin back to everlasting life. That's the gospel that those who are dead in sin are brought back to life. The power of God is God's love for you. It is God's grace for you. It is his mercy for you. And all of this is found in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that. That's the power of God for salvation. And I want you to, boy, if you want to underline something in your in Bible, it says, for everyone who believes. So it says here, for the Jew first and the Greek, we're the Greek, we're the Gentiles. The gospel does not discriminate. It doesn't say how educated you have to be. It doesn't say how smart, how unintelligent, how rich, how poor, how strong, how weak. None of that. It says for those who believe. It does not say for those who enter seminary and go, to mini and go into ministry full time. It doesn't say for those who flagellate themselves and try to do as many good works as possible and help people out. It just says for those who believe. So now we must take a look at the connection of God's righteousness and our faith. So it says, for in it... And the it, by the way, is the gospel. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now here, we're going to have to start to work on two different words, the meaning of words. One is righteousness. We're going to deal with that one first. We'll deal with faith in a little while. 
righteousness. In a very simple terms, you could say rightness. What is right? Thus, what is morally right? What is right justice, right virtue? What is uprightness? God says, and the Bible says, true righteousness comes from God and him alone. That he, his perfection is in every attribute, every attitude, every behavior, every word. Thus God's laws as given in the Bible both describe his own character and constitute the plumb line by which he measures human righteousness. Now, if you would do carpentry at all, you have squares, right? That you say, here is a straight line. This is the way we measure what is straight or what is crooked or not straight. I use the, the phrase plumb line too, right? It is, you tell what is exactly right. God is the measure of all of that. And one commentator said, not only is God righteous, but he expects righteousness of others. You and I are to reflect the very nature of our creator. This doesn't sound so bad, does it? We're supposed to do that. Have you tried to do that, though? Have you, have you obeyed all of the commandments? Right? Have you done? I, no, I fail. Jesus said, if you break one, you break them all. I've broken them all. I can't go a day without breaking any of the commandments. So if I take a look at how I'm supposed to be right before God, and you really and you really start to think about this, not just casually, but you think about it, it is terrifying because you know that God puts his wrath upon all unrighteous people. And by his righteousness, I'm not. Do you understand the dilemma that's going on here? That we are all condemned by his wrath because of his righteousness. And you see, here's the problem. In the Catholic Church at that time, the theologians of the day, and Luther up to this time, read this particular phrase, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. In the Latin, which is what the Catholic Church used, it said that God will make you righteous. Well, if God made me righteous, but I still act in a way that is unrighteous, how can I know that I am saved? There's a dilemma. God, God made me righteous, but boy, I'm still swearing, I'm still drinking, I'm still carousing, I'm still doing all that stuff. How can I know that I'm saved? I, I don't have assurance. So this is what happened. You have to work really hard to make sure that you have that righteousness. The Catholic Church said, you must go to Mass, otherwise you're not saved. You must go to confession, otherwise you're not saved. You must receive the sacraments, otherwise you're not saved. In fact, they could went so far as to say, you are, if you are outside the Roman Catholic Church, you're not saved. This is a great burden to bear. Think about the treadmill that you're on. You're working and you're working and you're working and you're working forever to try to be righteous. It is like this. Your righteousness, your righteousness always depended upon your faith plus how hard you worked. In essence, it becomes your faith plus your works. And this is a catch-22. Would you ever have assurance of salvation? No. Look, I ask people, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? And the answer I get mostly is, what do you think? I don't, know. I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. I've tried to do what is within me. I've tried to do my best, and I'm just going to rely on God for the rest. This is still alive today all over the place. Just not the Roman Catholic Church. I'm talking everywhere. Everywhere. 
And then you think about it, and if you're like Luther, you get serious about it, and you think, is it all a sham? Is, is this it? This is what Luther wrote. And I'm just going to put part of the quote up there for you. It's a longer quote. He said, Although I lived an irreproachable life as a monk, I felt I was a sinner with an uneasy conscience before God. Nor could I believe that I had pleased him by the satisfaction I could offer. I did not love, nay, in fact, I hated this righteous God who punished sinners, and if not with silent blasphemy, then certainly with great murmuring, I was angry at God, saying, as if it were not enough that miserable sinners should eternally be condemned by original sin with all kinds of misfortunes laid upon them through the Old Testament law, and yet God adds sorrow upon sorrow through the gospel and even bringing his righteousness and wrath to bear upon it. Thus I drove myself mad with a desperate and disturbed conscience, persistently pounding upon Paul in this passage with a parched and burning desire to know what he could mean. He said the gospel wasn't good news. It was just a greater burden to bear because now you only not to, had to be righteous. You had to be perfect for the gospel. This is what he's talking about here. And it just drove him to despair. But now let's take a look at faith. Um, so... When Luther looked at the original language, that is the Greek, and not the church's Latin translation, he saw that the word for righteousness meant regarded or counted. Righteousness did not make you good. You were declared as an illegal verdict. God's righteousness he declares that you are righteousness by his, not your worth. So it was counted to him as righteousness. It was not that you had to work really hard and to say, God, am I righteous? But it is righteousness declared to you, and it is declared for one reason and one reason only. Faith. What is faith? Faith is is trust. In a really simple manner, faith means trust. To have confidence, to have assurance. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I place my faith in you. Jesus, I place my assurance in you. This is faith. And Luther discovered it was faith alone that God counted you or declared you righteous. Think of the centurion, okay? The centurion in our gospel reading today. A Roman centurion, by the way, a high-ranking Roman soldier, he certainly would have uh, most likely been a pagan. He would have been worshiping pagan gods. You know, uh, Mars, who is the god of war, might have been worshiping Mars. He would have not done anything good according to what the Bible talks about being good. In his profession, he certainly would have killed many people and as most likely he murdered people. There was nothing good about this centurion. But he comes up to Jesus and he says, if you say the word, he will be healed because I know you have the authority to do that. And Jesus marveled at him. And he said, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. You have to understand how audacious that was. Here they were, all of Israel, God's chosen people, the ones who said, well, we have faith. And Jesus points this centurion, this pagan, this Gentile, this Greek, Roman. He says that, that man had faith greater than anyone else that I've seen. Think of Abraham, too. Now, if you read about Abraham, he's not such a great guy. He's a sinner. 
He lies, he cheats, he does all sorts of stuff. But he had faith. And it says, Abraham believed in the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. It wasn't because of how good Abraham was. It was because of his faith, God declared him righteous. Do you, do you understand this so far? I'm trying to lay the groundwork. Now, I want to go a little deeper with you. This is probably going to stretch your brains a little bit, but it is worthwhile to stretch your brains on this one. If you have your Bible, open up to Romans chapter 3, starting with verse 21. It's some dense language here but it is crucial to our understanding. So I'm going to read it. Romans chapter 3, starting with verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes boasting is excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Do you mean to say that my salvation doesn't depend on how good I am? You mean to say that it is Jesus who died for me, who was a propitiation, that means he bore the wrath of God? That God is the one who declares me justified? A, a, a verdict of not guilty? Not because of what I've done, because I am guilty. I've sinned. But that now... I have been declared righteous because of faith. And that's it. And the answer to all of that is yes, 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 yes. I'm going to now put it in simple terms. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Do you understand that now? Salvation and the power of God to bring you from death and sin to everlasting life. That's God's grace, love and mercy, and it is done through faith and faith alone. This was a revelation for Luther. He said, I felt myself straight away being born again to have entered to the open gates into paradise itself. From that moment, the whole face of scripture was changed. It is by faith and faith alone that we receive God's declaration of righteousness. You see, Luther understood now his faith can't grasp it. He can't use his faith to try to earn his salvation. We cannot work our way to deserving it. The only thing we can do with our faith is to receive it as a gift. You see, I have talked to many people who struggle with this greatly. I know a man who for years struggled with this. He and I had many conversations and uh, he couldn't get past the fact that he was a sinner and he wasn't good enough to deserve God's grace. And he struggled that with, with that to his very death and to this day, I, just, I don't know. I don't know if that was ever resolved for him. See, Jesus didn't come to call the righteous. He came for the sinners. 
So this is the call for you. This is the call for everyone. It is by faith and faith alone that we receive into God's declared righteousness. And when you think about it, you should relax because then it's all trusting in Jesus and what he has done. And that's faith alone. Does the Reformation still matter? You better believe it because it's faith and faith alone. Amen.